The Chiefs' revival has been driven by none other than their defense. We're going to chat with the leader on that side of the ball, the Honey Badger, coming up at 8.30. Dame once again shooting down rumors of leaving Portland. He did it in an interesting way yesterday, so why doesn't he want out? We'll tell you. And it is Thursday, which means it is Broussard's under duress list. It is back. We are excited. Good Thursday morning, everyone. Welcome to First Things First. Thanks for waking up Hi, with us. Everybody. Jenna Wolf, Nick Wright, Chris Broussard, Kevin Wilde. Broussard, give us a little taste of something we perhaps are not going to be expecting on your bud list this week. Well, there's always the question of will Patrick Mahomes be back on? As Wilds has so uh, adeptly pointed out the last de few days, no touchdowns in his last two games. No touchdown passes. He might be a good Yes, it's not great. Okay. Not Do great. rushing touchdowns not, not count for the same amount of points? We're just a fake news <laughs> operation, <No>. Jenna, <laughs> at this point. Not we I mean, we, we are not that thing. I, mean, I can tell you that. Not with my name associated. Hey, we're going to get to the NFLers under duress in a little bit. we got to start with one guy who was under plenty of duress in the NBA last night, James Harden. Harden and the Eastern Conference leading Nets in Houston. Harden in front of his former team. Harden struggled. No KD, no LaMarcus Aldridge, and at least from beyond the arc, no James Harden. The Beard hitting just three of his 12 three-point attempts. Turned it over eight times last night. As Houston won their seventh straight game, they beat Brooklyn 114-104. Nick, I'll start with you. Harden's problems, his struggles last night, big deal or no big deal? No, it's a big deal, not just because it's last night, but because it is a continuation of what has been the worst season of James Harden's career since he became a Houston Rocket. Like, you, you throw out the first few years in OKC when he's a rookie and then a sixth man. But since James Harden's been James Harden, this is the worst he's been, the worst he's looked, and it's not even close. And now, I will give him credit, Broussard. He is getting back to what he does best, which is tricking the refs. The last month, he has a bunch of 12 free throw games, 15 free throw games. So right. that helps him. That's how you can go four for 16, as he did last night, and still score 25 points. But there's no reason that James Harden shouldn't have been able to will the Nets to victory last night, even without KD and LaMarcus Aldridge. Can you believe that? LaMarcus Aldridge, the key third man for the Brooklyn Nets against a Rockets team that I know they're on a winning streak that you and I predicted, much to Kevin Wilde's chagrin. But that Rockets team yes. doesn't have a single <laughs> top 60 player. And outside of Christian Wood, they don't have a single top 120 player. And so why wasn't... Harden better. And here's the answer, Broussard, because he plays lazy basketball right now. He, he doesn't take mm. any twos. He settles for all threes, and he turns the ball over. And he's 32 years old, and you just wonder, like, why is it going to get better? So, no, I think it is a big deal. Mm. I think this is a guy who is supposed to be Without a doubt, one of the six best players in the sport. And thus far this year, he hasn't been one of the 36 best players in the sport. And so, yeah, I think it's a big deal. And I think it's a sign of how his season has gone. Wow. Okay. Um, I, I don't think the loss is a big deal. It's one of 82. And it's not surprising at how James Harden played. And that's the big deal. Like you said, like this, this is no longer a surprise. That he shoots, what, four for 16, whatever he was. I mean, those nights happen yep. now to James Harden. I wouldn't go as far as you to say he hadn't been one of the best 36 players. James Harden is averaging 20 and a half points a game, eight rebounds or seven and a half rebounds, and nine and a half assists. That would be, that he should be an all star this year. The problem is they need him to be a superstar, the superstar that they traded for. OK, if Kyrie Irving was was there, this would be great. What James Harden is doing, this would be fine, even though he's shooting 40 percent, which is his lowest since, as you said, he left OKC after his third year, his 20 points a game, the lowest since he left OKC. But that would be great if you had Durant giving you 28 and Kyrie giving you 26. 
But without Kyrie Irving, I need James Harden to give me 25, 26 points a night. And I don't know what – here's the, the – there's only three explanations to me for what James Harden is doing. Number one, he either – he had the worst hamstring injury in the history of mankind. Huh. All right, because he has not been the same since that hamstring injury. Number two, and this might sound – in this day and age, it might sound strange – it might be age and attrition. You mentioned Nick. He's 32 years old. He's in his 13th year. Listen to this. James Harden has played more regular season games than Larry Bird did in his career. James Harden yep. is a That's dozen right. games That's away from equaling Allen Iverson's total games played. He's had a yep. full career. Huh. And if you look at his body and, and stuff, and, you know, has he, has he yep. taken big minutes – a lot of playoff games, has he taken care of his body like sure. a LeBron James? Like a Kevin no. Garnett? Like a Carl Malone? I I'd say no. no. Okay, and so you have to, that's another consideration. Yes, he's still very good. But is he done being a superstar? And then the third one, Nick, is this. The pressure. We've all seen him in big pressure playoff moments. Not everyone, not, not every one of those moments does he fold but he's folded on a lot of them. And now the pressure is on again. He went to Brooklyn thinking, hey, I got KD. I got Kyrie. They can take the big shots. All I got to do is run the scary show, hours. be the playmaker, give you my 20 yeah, a game. Scary right. hours. Scary. Now, yeah. uh-oh, now there's pressure. He's got to be the guy again, you know, after KD. Under duress. And is he not liking playing with those expectations, well, Wiles? I think none of those three I, I are good, and that's a problem for the Nets. None of them are good reasons, and and let me just let me just push back for a moment on the All Star stuff uh, and and Wilds. I think that because the counting numbers are obviously good, they're not great, but they're good. But when you yep. add to the fact that they're he leads the great. NBA in turnovers, he leads the NBA in turnovers, five a game, and there are 50 guys shooting as many times a game as him. He's 46th in field goal percentage. Okay, so it's super inefficient, a lot of turnovers, not high volume scoring, yep. but good rebounding and assist numbers. Like, to me, I, I, I'd have to go through, I said, so you know, you he's don't not think top he's 36. An Unfortunately, Wilds. Well, I'd have to go through it. Listen, I got to go through. I'm not sure right now. I'd have to think, is there actually okay. 35 guys? I, I'm not quite certain. I'll, I'll, I'll have that for you in about eight minutes. But right now, I, I, I just think oh. I think he's worse wilds than the numbers even suggest. He hasn't been top 20, maybe 25, right? Okay. So we previewed the graphic that I will show in one minute. And the doctors on the set laughed at me. And, they, and they're just itching to tear this graphic apart. Stand by. I'm going to posit that this all started with the hamstring and the chain reaction of, hey, who is Harden started with that hamstring injury in March. And here's what happened. True. Had a hamstring injury, came back, couldn't condition. So now conditioning is off. All right, his conditioning is off. He talked about that earlier in the year. Then what happens? Lack of explosiveness. Okay, lack of explosiveness. Then you can't get separation. You can't get to the basket. He doesn't get a ton of foul calls. He gets out of rhythm. He loses confidence, and that affects the chemistry of the team. That all started with the hamstring. Now, can we show the graphic of his points before the hamstring injury, after the hamstring injury? Whether or not it was a huge deal, not a big deal, whether he, he trained it right, Broussard, we know that the guy has had, had pretty much an injury-free career. I'm not 100% sure that he dealt with this hamstring the right way. Now, there's some other wild cards out there. I think missing Kyrie, obviously a wild card. The rule changes, wild card. I think the new ball is a little bit of a wild card. Cuban talked about it yesterday on social media. But I think it all starts with the hamstring. And as the hamstring starts to get better, I expect James Harden to get better. I think that's fair because there's no denying the numbers. He was great before the hamstring. Now, whilst he did play well against Boston, 27 points a game, uh, 10 assists, something like that, seven rebounds in the playoffs, and in then the he re-aggravated the injury and obviously was has not been the yep. same since. So I, I just I, – I, I don't know. It, off the top of my head, I can't remember a hamstring injury – being this damaging to one player. And let me say this. You guys know I yeah. picked Brooklyn 
to win it all before the season. They're not winning the East as long if Milwaukee's healthy. They're not winning the East yeah. with this James Harden. They need James Harden to be the superstar. Oh, okay. They are, are you moving off the prediction guys out around against two. Phoenix. Against Phoenix, Golden State, Chicago, Milwaukee, and Miami, they're 0-6. All right? They, I yeah. mean, I, J, and I've written for James Harden. I've written hard for James Harden. Yeah. I've said he's one of the all-time elite scorers and playmakers, and that's a rare combination. But I am so disappointed. I, I am only Still Mrs. Harden is, is maybe more disappointed he in his play than me. can't beat anyone off the dribble anymore either. I'm, yes. I mean, he, he, Nash, one of those guys, too. But also, right, right. now, not that effective. We got a lot to get to on a Thursday morning. <laughs> Talking Dame Lillard right. now. Maybe. There's been growing speculation that Dame might want out of Portland after the two sides never quite hammered out an extension and with the Blazers searching for a new general manager. But Dame shut down those rumors yesterday, as he often does. He still seems all in on making it work in Portland. Take a listen. You know, I've been here for 10 years, and... Uh, I'm trying to be a part of this solution. You know, we are here to do a job. We are here to try to, to try to win and try to win big. And uh, you know, I feel like that's a, that's something that I'm here to do. And I'm just trying to be a part of the solution. I'm not trying to be a part of the gossip and a part of the the story. I'm not asking for a trade. You know, I I don't know how many times I got to say it. People, it's gotten to the point in this this era that. People can write stories and say things, and I heard this and I heard that, and because of who they are, people take it as like, this is credible. All right, Broussard, I feel like he wants to stay in Portland. Uh, Dame denying that he wants to trade is blank. Well, it's irrelevant at this point, um, because at this point, with all this going on with the Blazers organization, with them being mediocre at best under new coach Chauncey Billups, it's no longer Dame's decision if I'm the Blazer. It's no longer, oh, if he'll have us if he wants to stay, of course we'll keep him. No, I got to look at what's best for the organization, and that might be moving Dame. Now, I'm going to throw out some history for Dame to listen to and consider. I love his loyal to the soil stance. I love the fact that he has the same mentality as Allen Iverson had in Philadelphia and Russell Westbrook once had in Oklahoma City. That look, this is my franchise, this is my city, I want to win a championship here, and if I fail, if I don't, so be it, but I'm going to go down swinging right here. That is admirable. But guess what? The teams ultimately decided, I'm move we're moving Allen Iverson. We're moving Russell Westbrook. Yep. And what followed was a series yep. of trades with both of those guys where they ended up in several different franchises. I would say before you end up like one of those guys, uh, Dame, and, and obviously it's not terrible for Westbrook, but look at Kevin Garnett. That's another one he can learn from. Kevin Garnett was the same way, Nick. In Minnesota, even though they weren't a great team by the point, by his end there, he was like, look, I love it here. I'm loyal. This is where I'm staying. They drafted me. They took a chance on me. I'm not going anywhere. He finally, grudgingly accepted the trade to Boston and loved it. Won a and championship then, and then right. start talking later on about, man, I, I only times. wish I had done this earlier. Yes. So that There's they need to look at that and consider wanting to move on. Keep your start on the stream with you for a moment, because there's two other things to add to your point. One is KG's time in Minnesota, very similar to Dame's, in that you had the one year where you make the conference finals, but every other year you're in the playoffs and an early exit. Remember, the, and so the one year it's like, oh, we're close with Cassell and Sprewell, but you never actually were yep. all that close. And that's despite KG being league MVP. The other thing, and you bring this up all the time, Broussard, and this is not Dame's fault. Winning a title when your best player is a small guard, Isaiah and Steph, that's it. That's the list. That's right. And as good as Dame is, he's not Isaiah and he's not Steph. It's not an indictment. He's top 75 all-time guy. He's a Hall of Famer. I, I'm right. not here to, th and I know he's having a bad year. I'm not here, but that is, those are two of the 16 greatest players ever, Isaiah and Steph. He's not that. 
So it was very, and by the way, is Steph needed some luck, you know, some injury luck to win the one title he has with, without KD alongside him. So it's just really, well, really I, hard. I don't know about so that. So you, regardless, uh, no, 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 I'm just, funny. all I'm saying is <laughs> it's just really hard to do it when you're a small guard. But you and I are on the same page. And, and Wilds, I put maybe not the point. Because the Blazers are 11th in the West. They are Dame, CJ, and Norm Powell are 90 plus million of their cap moving forward. You're, you, you, you can't build a contender. So, Kevin Wilds, would you like some fake trades, my friend? How many would you like? One, two, There's or nothing. three? Like, How many Christmas fake trades early. would you like? I I'll take I'll, I'll take two. It's just nice. Then I can decide. Okay. Two for Christmas, please. All right. Please. Then I had a fake trade involving the Celtics. We're getting rid of it. Here's one that everyone yeah. knows is out there. And I think, you know Chauncey, I think he'd enjoy coaching this team. Dame for Ben, Tybal, and Maxi. You get all the Sixers back Ooh, like that. for Ben Ooh. Simmons. Or, I mean, for Damian Lillard. You got Defense. I, it's a that steep like price, it. but because Dame yeah. is under a long-term contract, I think Daryl would do it. I don't know this. I've not talked to Daryl about this. I'm not reporting it, but I think that's similar to what Daryl offered for Harden. Harden and Dame are in a very similar echelon. By the way, both are really struggling this year, but that's the one everyone knows. Now the now the one to blow your mind, all right? You ready for it? I do that if I'm going. I know people like in oh, a you can't you would do it. Okay. What about this one, though? If I'm Portland, What if you yeah. really want to rip it down to the studs in Portland? Damian Lillard for Wiseman, Kaminga, Moody, and because you got to make the salaries work, Wiggins. If you're Golden State, the only guy of those four that is doing anything for you this year is Wiggins. You add Dame, you have Steph, Dame, Clay, and Draymond. Plus, you Gary Payton Jr. and the fun guys you're playing. You still have Otto Porter. What if now Portland would? It would be admitting defeat to the Warriors. That's one. If you're Golden State, three of those guys are not helping you at all, and you're the best team in the league, arguably this year. Dame for Wiseman, Kaminga, Moody, Wiggins. Send it in. Send it in, Wilds. Okay. Mm. Here, here's my take. Where's I think you, you, have to, you have to sweeten the Warriors pot a, a little bit. I don't know how good Gary Payton uh, the second is outside of the Warriors system, but I, I, he lights up the screen when he's playing Broussard. Here's the thing, Broussard. If, if I was Dame, even though I'm from Oakland, I would want to go to Philly because I feel like at this point, you're, you're, you know, you're starting to get up towards 35. You got to start thinking about your legacy. Like, man, if I yep. win a championship with Steph... Is anyone really gonna like think a lot of me? Think I'm awesome? Probably not. You're right. Yeah. If I win a championship in Philly, huh? Maybe that would be it. That would be a nice. You're the second sort best guy either way. My cap. So if I was Dame, I would take the Philly deal. I, I'm with Wilds on this one. First of all, I, I don't love the Golden State deal. I, I don't know. I mean, you're giving up some defense. That's one of the big reasons why they're playing so well. And they're rolling without Clay. I don't know if I want to mess with that. As great as Dame is and how would he fit, they have a lot of ball movement running around. Like, I don't know if it's the perfect fit. But Wilds is right. I well, think it's might. important, Nick, to Dame. I think it's important to Dame to be the top guy. I think that's a big reason why he wants to stay in Portland. Like, it's his team. He's the number one guy. There's talk that he wants to go to New York. He would be the number one guy. Sure. Philly, he'd be number two, as you said. But I think he needs to go to Philadelphia if he wants to win a championship. And if you'll go to New York, it can't be well, about you not you know, leaving the West and going to the East Coast. Because if you go to New York, then why won't you go to Philly? You, his best chance of winning a ring well, is you in might Philly. Not like my and he State would get trade. the most credit for it in Philly. You might not like my Golden State trade, but right after I said it, Bob Myers rang my doorbell, so he likes it. He, uh, he might pluck me off the show. Yes. Uh, try to get me, get, get me. Golden I like State the Toronto. Philly one, though, Nick. The Philly one is good. Hey, like it's that. under duress time. It's a lot. Which one of these guys will be atop this week's edition of Broussard's Bud Lists? Broussard will tell us, and.
Tyron Matthew joining us at 8.30. That'll be fun. Lots of things to talk to him about. Much more first things first right after this. But list time. Hey, let's face it. The under the rest list, it's really served more as a motivation all season. Some weeks. Yes. yes. And for some... More than others. Back for week 14, which kicks off tonight on Fox. Big Ben and the Steelers, Captain Kirk and the Vikings. All right, Chris Broussard, without further ado, tell us which five guys are under the most duress this week. All right, here we go, Jenna. At number five, we're going to Dallas for Dak Prescott. All right? This is a huge game. I know a lot of people take it for granted. Oh, Dallas is going to win the NFC East. If they lose this game to Washington on Sunday... All right, they are a game ahead of the Washington football team. That's it. And they still have to play Washington in a few more weeks. So they've got to win this game. And here's the thing. Where's the run game going to come from? We know Ezekiel Elliott is battling a, a pesky knee injury. So what's he going to be like? And on top of that, Washington is third in the NFL against the run. So uh, Dak is going to have to carry them with his arm and this is the question that's always dogged him. Can he do it? So Dak Prescott, you're under duress. At number four, we stay in the NFC, Matthew Stafford. Oh, I know he looked great last week against Jacksonville. Of course he did. That's what he does. He was 8-68 and 68 when he came to L.A. against teams with winning records. And this year he's 2-3 and three with three straight losses against teams with winning records. He eats up the chumps, all right? And I, Nick, I'm sorry. I know you love Trevor Lawrence. Jacksonville's a bunch of chumps this year, all right? What is he going to do against a good team? They play Arizona. He already lost to them once this season. It's a big division game. But he has got to prove to onlookers and maybe people in that locker room and organization that he can have good games, great games, against the elite teams and lead them to victory. Otherwise, Why'd you give up Jared Goff, who, while not as good, led you to a Super Bowl? Oh, and two first-round picks with Jared Goff for Matthew Stafford. If he can't beat the good teams, he's under duress. At number three, Lamar Jackson. Lamar was on last week, and Jenna, it didn't motivate him. He went out there and had seven sacks, and, and three or four of them were his fault for holding the ball too long. And Lamar has been struggling. You know, last five games, seven touchdowns, eight interceptions. Two weeks ago when they beat Cleveland 16-10, to 10, he had four interceptions. Lamar is not playing well, and there's a narrative now that if you pressure him, whether it's with the blitz or otherwise, and go cover zero, you can neutralize Lamar Jackson. Here's the other thing. They need to win this game. They're 8-4 and four right now. It's looking good. Yep. But That's their right. schedule is rugged. Right? They got Green Bay, uh, Cincinnati, the Rams, and Pittsburgh after this. So they need, Cleveland might be their lightest game remaining. They need to get a W. Lamar yep. needs to be great. Number two, Josh Allen. And, Nick, you've been on this all year, really his whole career. He's the roller coaster. And last week he was down. All right? 50% of his passes completed. I get it. The weather was inclement. All right, and he was facing Bill Belichick, but he didn't play well. Only 10 points he managed. He was twice in the red zone in the last nine minutes, couldn't produce any points. So Josh Allen, look, they've got seven wins, only one of them against a winning team, okay? And just like Baltimore, they're seven and five, Nick. Right now, they are seventh. Obviously, that's the last playoff spot in the AFC. If they lose to Tampa Bay, which is not only possible, but probable. They will fall out of the playoff race, at least temporarily, or, you know, the playoff spots. Yep. And this is a team that we thought, some thought would reach the Super Bowl. At number one, he's become a mainstay. I know he was off last week because they had a bye. Ugh. But Baker Mayfield, he's been on this list so much that the bud list could actually stand for Baker under duress. <laughs> All right, and this is not a gimmick. He is the most guy, the guy most under the rest. I know Wiles and Nick want to give him a pass. Oh, Baker, don't play anymore. You're dinged up. You got a couple cuts and a couple scrapes. He should have gotten a little bit more healthy over the bye week. All right, and now you've got Baltimore 
They just beat you a couple weeks ago. They're six and six. Nick and I picked this team to reach the AFC Championship. A few people actually picked them to reach the Super Bowl. And now they're out of the playoffs. But if they win this game, they're right back in the thick of things. So Wilds, Baker Mayfield, no surprise, most under duress this week. All right, so I'm going to add somebody to this list who oddly hasn't gotten a lot of criticism. It's Trevor Lawrence. Like, oh, Wilds, he's just a rookie. Leave Trevor Lawrence alone. There, you know, he's got to learn. He's on the Peyton Manning path. He's on the Troy Aikman path. Like, okay, maybe, maybe. But Nick, you said something very interesting. When we were talking about the draft, you said there's five quarterbacks in this draft. What are the chances that none of them are a disappointment? That we go five for five. I said, you know what, that's, that's interesting. And I think the way to yeah. look at it is like a game of musical chairs. It's like disappointment musical chairs, Broussard. And the disappointment music's going on. And everybody's walking around. And guess what, music stops. If you're a disappointment, sit down. You know who's left standing? Mac Jones. Mac Jones like, I'm out of the game, guys. Have fun. It's going to go around again. Who's the next person off? Oh, probably Justin Fields, right? Justin Fields is showing some flashes, sure. probably is not going to be a disappointment. So now you're left with Trey Lance, Zach Wilson, who's been hurt and has got the sort of the Jets curse, and Trevor Lawrence, who was supposed to be the, the no-brainer, guaranteed, can't-miss number one guy. All I'm saying is, show me something. Show me something. You won a game in London, pretty good, but a little London game kind of funky. You won the game against the Bills at home where neither, scored, neither team scored 10 points. The last five games, you store, you've thrown one touchdown. You haven't thrown any interceptions, but one touchdown. You're going into Tennessee coming off a bye. Not easy, don't get me wrong. But they are 26 in passing. And for all the dinking and dunking that Mac Jones does, Mac Jones did throw for 310 yards and two touchdowns. So I'm not calling him a bust. I'm not saying anything like that. But we were very hard on Tua last year in a smaller sample size for a team that wasn't great. In the, year, in the same year, Joe Burrow came out right away from a Bengals team that stunk, and he got a few wins, and everyone's like, you know what, Joe Burrow, the real deal. We haven't been able to say that yet about Trevor Lawrence. I'd like to see something. That's why I'm putting him on the bud list. Great points, Wilds. Uh, you, you really did hit some great points. And, and Nick, yeah, he rips Mac Jones for dinking and dunking. His last five, six games, Trevor Lawrence has averaged about five yards per attempt. And in four of those five games, he hasn't thrown for 165 yards. So he's struggling. He's actually been regressing, actually. Now, I'm not predicting bust either, but it would be nice for him to go out and show us something over these last few weeks. But here's the thing and why he didn't make this list, Wilds. He has kind of a buffer. His coach gets more criticism, Urban Meyer, than he does, right? And so As nobody's really expecting yeah. anything from Trevor Lawrence. And they're looking more because his coach is such a, a, a you know, c controversial figure. People are looking more at Urban Meyer than they're looking at Trevor Lawrence. So for yeah. those reasons, I don't think there's pressure on him. They play Tennessee. Nobody expects him to win that game. But you are right about his lack yeah. of production. All right, so I, Liz, you guys can, you know, sell your Trevor Lawrence stock. I will scoop it up. I'm a holder when it comes to Trevor Lawrence. You guys have paper hands. That's fine. I will scoop it up like I did Wilds Bitcoin when he panicked 18 months ago. Thanks for that, Wilds. I'm going to quickly mention three oh, yeah. guys, all three <laughs> quarterbacks, all coming off a buy. I'm mean, all coming off a loss, pardon me, all in the final year of their contract. Carr, Cousins, Jimmy G. Speaking of musical chairs... Where are any of these guys playing quarterback next year? I think it's in question for all of them. Cousins, his numbers this year have been unbelievable, but they have had back-to-back -back devastating losses, and he has the third highest cap hit in football next year. He's 45 million bucks. Jimmy G, obviously the team doesn't want him anymore, as evidenced by what they did to get Trey Lance. And Derek Carr, and we'll talk to Honey Badger about this, Derek Carr, third straight year, the Raiders get off to a good start, Third straight year, they absolutely collapse. I think all three of those guys 
could be playing for different teams next season. So to me, Broussard, they're all under duress right now. Well, Jimmy G, here's the thing. We know he's out of there, right? So I don't know how much pressure. I actually think he's kind of playing free. We know they've gotten healthy over the last few weeks. You know, Debo Samuel's been out. If he's out again this week, that you know, that's an excuse for Jimmy G. But he's playing freely because I think he knows this is it. Trey Lance is the quarterback next year. So he's been, you know, they've been winning a few games despite their loss last week. Derek Carr, uh... I feel like he's got built-in excuses, Nick. And I know they rebounded a bit a couple weeks ago, but with what happened to John Gruden and then the tragedy with Henry Ruggs, and now Darren Waller, is he going to play this week? He's been out. I, these are built-in excuses for him, and, and that, they play Kansas City. So I know you and yeah. nobody else is really expecting him to win that game. You know, so... I think those are some built-in excuses for him that if they lose, hey, it's understandable. And then Kirk Cousins, we, we just know what Kirk Cousins is. Like, that's the thing. And, in fact, it goes for all three of these guys. Nick, We know what they are. They're good quarterbacks. They're not elite quarterbacks. All of them will be starting somewhere next year, but maybe not where they're at this year. You're right about that. Right now, talking to some Lamar Jackson, he and the Baltimore Ravens will be in Cleveland on Sunday, face the Browns. To say this Ravens offense has hit a rough path should be a bit of an understatement. They haven't scored 20 points in any of their last four games. Lamar's been under constant pressure, and he's been turning the ball over way too often. Since week six, Lamar ranks among the league's worst quarterbacks in all four major passing categories, perhaps a little wisdom from a man with a plan would help Lamar. Time for Coach Eric Mangini's game plan. So we brought in Eric Mangini. It would be <laughs> awkward if we brought in someone else, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? It would uh, be a little bit. Coach, what is the game plan? It would be weird if we brought in a different It'd guy and we called yeah. it your game plan. The game plan for Lamar uh, to get back on track this weekend against the Cleveland Browns. Well, the first thing is, is something that Chris has been talking about uh, throughout the show, and, and that's they've got to find some better answers to, to pressure. And the, and the pressure is real. They're the most pressured team in the NFL. They're the most sacked team in the NFL. And they can incorporate some more screens, some more quick passes, some more RPOs, something. They, they've got to find some way to slow that down from, from everybody who's, who's now jumping on that bandwagon. The second thing, and, and, and I think this could help them a lot, is to incorporate some more no huddle. They're, they're 26 in the league in terms of how much no huddle they run. And what that does is it simplifies the defense and, and it, it usually slows them down in terms of what they can do. And that'll allow Lamar to do a, a lot of things in, in terms of making plays with the ball in his hand and, and just being able to get nice, clean reads. And it puts the pressure back on the defense. The third thing, and this is what I'm going to show you uh, on tape, is they've got to be able to control the interceptions. And and you talked about the turnovers. It, it's 13 uh, picks this year through 11 games and 18 picks through the other 37 games. And the answer is, is to take what's there and take calculated risks. You don't have to be Superman on every play. And, l and let me show you what I mean against the Cleveland Browns. And we're going to take a look at, at his second interception. So they come back and, and Baltimore's in a bunch formation, which is the exact same formation that they were in on the previous pick. They've got the backside receiver. He's in a in a tight split, which indicates that he's gonna do this, run a shallow cross. That, that's a, a heavy key for that. Now on the front side, the tight end's gonna hook up. And, and this combination between these two players is exactly what they ran the previous pick. It was just slightly over a little bit. The Browns are in this cover four shell, what they played on the previous pick. So now we're seeing like with like. And what that indicates now is the safety over on the left, he's either gonna come and get the, the tight end. He, he's got the tight end vertical if it's quarters coverage, or if it's cover one, he's gonna drop in this hole. So now the shallow cross happens, which there's no receiver on the left-hand side. So the safety's freed up, the corner's freed up. Lamar should know that. He should see the safety. He should confirm that the safety now is coming down into, into the box, which everything tells you that by, by his body uh, presence and his body language. And now he's going to try to jam the tight end into the or jam the ball into the tight end, which you could with a with a 
perfect throw, but look how tight these two defenders are. It's a small window, and you've got the shallow crosser in front that's going to go for 15 to 20 yards. You don't have to do this. And look at the path of the ball. You're going to see that the ball, it's got to be perfectly thrown. It's thrown to the left, which means it's either thrown poorly or he doesn't recognize that the safety is coming down from the, from the left-hand side and he's trying to throw it away from the safety on the right-hand side. Either way, both of those things are a problem. And, and at the end of the day, the easy answer is take what's there. Take take the, the, the shallow cross and, and don't try to push the ball into these tight windows when you don't have to. There's no reason for it and it, it's got to stop if, if they're going to get better. Coach, I, it's a great film breakdown as always. And when I'm watching it, because I didn't, I didn't remember that specific play. When I'm watching it, I was like, he's not going to throw. He's not going to throw. He's staring at Mark. He's staring at the tight end. The safeties are there, and then he throws exactly where you think he can't be wanting to throw there. But I want to talk about the first point, which is a point Broussard has hammered, which is the inability to deal with pressure. So. I feel like something that is almost just taken as a given is the worst thing you can do against great quarterbacks is blitz them. I feel like Brady, for his entire career, has annihilated the blitz. Rodgers, Russell Wilson, Mahomes' teams stopped blitzing Mahomes entirely about midway through last season because it was he had like a 140 career passer rating. Why do you think... Lamar, someone who should be able to escape the blitz if pressure does get there better than anybody in league history other than Michael Vick, maybe. Why do you think he struggled with it so much and, and how much of that is specifically on him versus the coaches not getting, you know, having him ready for a secondary pitch, if you will? Well, when you're when you're blitzing a, a great running quarterback, what you're going to do is you're going to fill up all of the different running lanes and make sure that there's an edge set and force them to make quick decisions, and 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 you take away their ability to actually answer with a run. That that's taken out of the equation. So now that quarterback has to find a different answer that's effective, and you've got to actually hurt your opponent a few times. To, to take them out of that package. And that's what I was talking about, where you incorporate more screens. They run some wide receiver screens. They don't run a lot of tight end screens. They don't run uh, very many screens to the backs. It's, it's usually just outside. And the effectiveness with those screens hasn't been very good. So put more emphasis on that. More quick throws where you're just, and, and quick throw combinations to beat the blitz. So hopefully you can catch and run, because you only have to break one tackle. and and. You know, it, it, it's a big play in that situation. And then the RPOs have been very effective, too, where you're, you've got the option to, to hand the ball off if you like the numbers. If you don't, it's a quick pass. So it's another way to, to, to get to that concept. But it's, it's, it's an issue, and they're not making anybody pay, and it's going to keep coming. Coach, I've been advocating since the offseason for Lamar Jackson to go ahead and get his extension contract done with the Ravens. Obviously, that hasn't happened. And if you look at each of the last three years, his touchdowns and passer rating are down. His interceptions are up. Obviously, he's not having a good year this year. If you were in Baltimore, how concerned would you be about his future? Well, I'm, I'm always concerned when, when you have a quarterback that runs as much as, as Lamar does because it's, it's a significant amount of wear and tear uh, on the body, and, and when you're going to make a long-term commitment financially, he, you it tends to to to, to take that per, or that player out of that type of philosophy. So he, organizationally, you're sitting back and saying, is is his type of play sustainable because of the amount of, of hits he takes? But if you if you pull back on that, are you going to get the same effectiveness for, from from him as a quarterback? So it's it's a hard. It's a hard answer or hard question to answer, and it's a big money question to answer that, that they're going to have to do really soon. Back here talking to the Kansas City Chiefs, winners of five in a row, thanks in large part to their defense, a defense that's looked like one of the league's very best the last couple of weeks. That defense, led by three-time all-pro safety Tyron Matthew, who is joining us right now on First Things First this morning. Tyron, good morning. Before we talk on-field stuff, I want to ask you an off-field question. You were just nominated for the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award. That is fantastic. Congratulations. What does that mean to you? 
Thank you. Um, I'm extremely honored. Um, you know, definitely humbled uh, and really fortunate and blessed to to be able to represent this organization. You know, my teammates. Um, you know, even a, a lot of guys that I've played with, you know, in the past uh, that have been a part of this award. And so um, it's a tremendous honor. Um, and I'm just really extremely thankful. And, and listen, we've talked to you a number of times and we've gone over, you know, your story. So we don't have to rehash it right here. But as someone who's from Kansas City and still obviously has a lot of connections there, my dad lives there, some of my best friends live there. The way you have embraced the city and the city's embraced you. And for this, I mean, you were an all decade member. You're going to finish your career with a Hall of Fame case. But your arc as like a man and a leader to leading towards the Walter Payton Man of the Year nomination is top of the resume stuff. So sincerely, congratulations. And I know how much it means to you. And so I just want to say that on behalf of everyone to reiterate it. I also want to say this on behalf of everyone. A uh, bunch of Chiefs haters on this show, man, except for me. I mean, we got, you know, Broussard <laughs> picked you guys to win the Super Bowl, but now is thinks Mahomes isn't good anymore. Wilds doesn't think the Chiefs are allowed to win with defense. Wins don't count. Kansas City can only win games 45-42 or else it doesn't actually count. It's a very weird thing. So let's talk about that defense, this dominant Steel Curtain-esque defense over the last two months. I have my own theories, but I want to know yours. It was, a, it was an awful defense the first month of the year. The, uh, aside from that pick against the Ravens, the most memorable ver view of you is your hands up looking around. What the hell are you guys doing? And now no one can score. So what changed? Well, I think it's really just uh, been a commitment to each other, you know, commitment to, you know, our coaches and then the guys, you know, in the locker room. Um, uh, you know, I think – you know, early on, we realized nobody was really coming to save us uh, and, and that we would have to figure it out, you know, with the guys that really, you know, we have in the room. And, you know, we've been able to get some guys healthy. Um, you know, some young guys have been stepping up for us. Um, you know, some old guys have been stepping up for us. So we're going to continue to need that um, as we continue to uh, push through this season. But uh, it, it's really been all about getting better, you know, at something, you know, each and every day. Uh, and then, like I said, just – just finding that commitment, you know, to each other, you know, each and every play. Tyron, uh, Nick mentioned Patrick Mahomes earlier. Obviously, he's viewed as maybe the best guy to throw the football ever in the history of the NFL. You guys as a team are kind of viewed as the team to beat, certainly in the AFC, if not the whole league. What is it like playing with that type of pressure on your shoulders? And, and early in the season, is that something that, maybe took you guys a while to adjust to, and that's why you had some of the struggles that you did. Well, I, I think every year you, you, you deal with different challenges. Um, you know, um, every year, you know, it's a different team, and you, you know, I think early in the year in training camp in the preseason, uh, you, you, each and every year you try to recreate, you know, your identity. Um, and I feel like this year is it kind of taking us a while to, you know, get back to, you know, what it, what it is that, that we are, you know, as a football team, but, you know, we don't really consider it uh, pressure. You know, uh, it's been a tremendous honor to, you know, represent the AFC, you know, the last couple seasons in the Super Bowl. Um, and, and to do it a third time, we understand that, you know, it's going to be a great challenge and, it, you know, it won't be peachy and, and, and rosy. You know what I mean? Like, we're going to have, you know, ups and downs. And um, I'm, I'm just mostly proud, you know, uh, of my group, my team, you know, my coaches, because, you know, none of us really complain. Um, you know, all of us, you know, really feel uh, like we, we have a great opportunity uh, in front of us. And um, so uh, the only thing on our mind is just kind of getting better. Uh, and then, like I mentioned, just staying together, you know, as a team. Darren, you mentioned Peachy and Rosie, and I, I get it, but you, I, you know, you have to admit, you guys probably came into the season confident. You, you've done nothing wrong, really, over the last two years. I'm wondering, Broussard mentioned some of the early season struggles. How much of that was a wake-up call for you guys? Like, this isn't going to be a walk in the park. We do have to show up every single weekend. Nothing's just going to be handed to us. How much did that factor in that sort of almost it seems like turned things around in the last couple weeks? Yeah, well, I think we realized, you know, early on that, you know, we would get everybody's best shot. You know, I think a lot of teams, you know, in the off season, they they kind of build, you know, and prepare to really, you know, stop and be able to defend the Chiefs. So, you know, uh, we, we understood that, you know, early on in the season.
So I, I got a couple questions for you about the offense and then about this week's opponent, if I may. On the offense, you're around these guys every day. You practice against them every day. Is there something different to you about Patrick Mahomes over the last couple months than the Patrick Mahomes you've practiced against over the last couple years? No, I, I, no. I, I think uh, if not, you know, in my opinion, you know, he's gotten better. You know, I think during the season, you don't really practice. You don't really compete. You know, uh, we don't compete really as much against each other. But, you know, I felt like in training camp, um, you know, he was really doing some great things. I felt like he was really getting better, you know, f from that aspect. But, you know, I don't really see anything different in these guys. You know, obviously, you know, these are some of the best players, you know, in the world. And, um, you know, I think, you know, we all as players, you know, you know have rough patches, have times where, you know, it, it, it doesn't seem to be working. But, you know, I think as an athlete, um, you know, as a champion, uh, you just continue to work hard. You continue to put your work in, um, understanding that, you know, it's a long season. And, you know, at some point, you know, we'll be able to figure it out. What do you think of the as a defensive player who goes against great quarterbacks and some bad ones, too, obviously? What do you think of the narrative of, oh, you know, it took three years, but you figured it out. You played two high shell defense. And all of a sudden, Patrick Mahomes is a mere mortal. It was that simple. I don't know why it took 50 games and a Super Bowl and an MVP for everyone to figure it out. What do you think of that idea of you take away the deep stuff to Tyreek, double Kelsey, and all of a sudden the Chiefs offense is very beatable? Well, I, I don't I don't really necessarily buy that. Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, a lot of times this season, you know, the ball has really been bouncing, you know, the, the, the other team's way, the other defensive way. Uh, you know, um, uh, I think a lot of these plays, you know, uh, really come back to, you know, really focus. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm not necessarily here to, you know, critique, you know, my teammates. Um, for me, as a leader, as a player, you know, I'm all about encouragement. I'm all about encouraging. Um, you know, I'm all about boosting these guys uh, because I know the kind of work that they put in. And, you know, I can see their potential, you know, from uh, really day to day, you know. So, all right, I got one more question for you, and it's about this week's game. So, you know this as well as I do. There's a lot of great things about Arrowhead, best tailgating experience in the world, loudest crowd in the NFL. What is not great about Arrowhead is the surrounding uh, accoutrement, if you will. There's like a Taco Bell. I think there's a Drury Inn. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere in Raytown. I say that to say this. <laughs> it's kind of odd for a team to take laps around the stadium after a game, not a lot to see. Yet the last time the Raiders were in Kansas City, that's exactly what they did. I'm curious, they're back in Kansas City. You guys, of course, have kicked their teeth down their throat the two times since then, but not in Kansas City. I'm curious if that's come up in the meetings at all this week. Remember the last time the Raiders came to Kansas City, what they did after the game? I don't think, I don't think anybody's really you know, talking about it uh, you, you know, this week. Um, you know, I think this is like any other week. You know, it's a big time, really divisional opponent, uh, you know, a divisional rival rivalry that really goes way back. And so I think just that alone, you know, this game means a lot. Um, I, I think obviously we're aware of, you know, the last time they, they came here, you know, uh, they came out victorious. So I think in our minds, you know, this week of all weeks is really important to, you know, uh, take care of, you know, uh, our home field and, you know, really give our fans a chance to, you know, be an impact, you know, Sunday. Tyron, whether you watch the game or not, obviously you've heard about New England beating Buffalo and running or passing the ball just three times. And, and Buffalo, some of their defensive backs were asked about, was that embarrassing? They got offended by it. But I got to ask you, if a team passed the ball only three times against you guys, and beat you, would you as, you're a leader on that defense, would you be embarrassed? Would you be insulted? Like, there is no way we can let something like that happen. Yeah, I'd I, I, I probably be a, a little bit disappointed. First of all, I'm always mad anytime we lose. I don't, it, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm always mad. Uh, so, but it, it, you know, you don't really see a lot of teams do it. Um, you know, at least, you know, it hasn't really happened, you know, last 50, you know, 60 years. So it's unusual. And, you know, you never want to lose games, you know, the unusual way, you know, because, you know, obviously, you know, everybody can see it. But, um, you know, definitely, definitely would be uh, disappointed.
Tyron, there has been a groundswell of Mac Jones support. It started in Alabama, then it moved up to New England, but there was still a lot of Mac Jones haters out there in the world, including on our very own show, Nick Wright. And then, like <laughs> mana from heaven, I look on social media, and there is one of the best players in the NFL saying, quote, the dude can play, period. He wasn't trendy enough, you're funny. <laughs> Day in and day out, you should be on Comedy Central. Then you said the dude can play, period. Do you have any message for uh, Nick Wright specifically on how good <laughs> Mac Jones is? And what have you been impressed by uh, by him? Yeah, listen, man, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a football junkie. You know, I love it. Um, you know, I love to watch other players. Uh, I, I love to watch, you know, other positions, uh, especially these young guys that, that, that come into the league. And um, for me, um, you know, he, he's just... Fundamentally, when I look at him, um, I, I see a quarterback. Uh, I see a guy that takes care of the football, that, that understands the game, that, that really understands uh, his weapons and, and really how to utilize those guys. And um, uh, so even him being an Alabama guy and me being an LSU guy, um, I, I think at the end of the day, I could put all that aside uh, and, and really see the, see the young man and, and really see a, 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 a really good quarterback. Yeah. It was great. I mean, those three passes they let him throw. I mean, it, I mean, two of them were off target, but I mean that one, the one little screen pass. I mean, listen, nothing screams we love our quarterback like letting him throw as many passes as Pringle has thrown this year. Let me tell you. I mean, it just screams faith in the quarterback. Other than that, answer is a great job, Tyron. Tyron, thank you, man. Tyron Matthew, thank you so much for uh, hanging out with us this morning. Good luck. On Thank Sunday you. against the Raiders. We appreciate the time. This was fun. Thank you, man. All right, we got to take a turn here. Sunday on Fox, the fight for the NFC East continues. Dak leading the Cowboys into a huge showdown against Taylor Heineke and Washington. Catch it only on Fox and the Fox Sports app. Check local listings for the game in your area. All right, stories to start your morning now, sponsored by Ram Trucks, built to serve. And we're talking James Harden, the beard and the Eastern Conference leading Nets in Houston last night. And in front, Harden's former team struggled. No KD, no LaMarcus Aldridge, and at least from beyond the arc, no James Harden. The beard hitting just three of his 12 three-point attempts. The beard turning it over eight times as well. Not good. Houston wins their seventh straight. They beat Brooklyn 114-104. Nick, were Harden's struggles in the loss last night a big deal or no big deal? Oh, I think they were a big deal. And they were a big deal because if there was any night you thought we would get a throwback Harden performance, it's, oh, there's no Kevin Durant and I'm back in Houston. And Houston, despite the winning streak, Outside of Christian Wood, doesn't have a single top 75 player on the roster. Let me cook. And instead, he had twice as many turnovers as he had two-point field goal attempts. He took four twos. Now, he did get to the line because he's starting to trick the refs again. Good for him in that regard. But Broussard, his numbers this year were a third of the way through the season. Show the numbers and where they rank for his career. It's the fewest points since he was in Oklahoma City. It's the worst field goal percentage of his career, the worst three-point percentage of his career, and the second most turnovers ever. In the NBA this year, he leads in turnovers, and of guys taking at least 14 and a half shots a game, he's 46th out of 50 in field goal percentage. He, he needs to be a top 10 guy at worst for the Nets to have any shot. He has not been a top 30 guy. It's a huge problem. And I don't see, because now we can't blame it on the free throws anymore, Broussard, because he's getting to the line again. Right. And he still is not, has not been good. He just flatly hasn't been good. No, you're right, Nick. Look, the loss is not a big deal, one out of 82. But James Harden's play, not only last night, but this entire season, is a huge concern. And you guys know I picked Brooklyn in the preseason to win it all. They won't get out of the East with this James Harden. I, Nick, I think Harden has still played at an all-star level. His numbers are 21, nine and a half assists, and eight rebounds. So he's putting up numbers. But he's not a superstar right now. And without Kyrie Irving, they need James Harden to be a super-duper star along with Kevin Durant to have a shot 
to beat Milwaukee. Not never mind the teams in the West. All right, so this is a huge problem, and you mentioned it. He's getting to the line now, but he's still not as aggressive as he needs to be. And Wilds, that is a big problem with Harden. He's not being aggressive. He, Nick, one thing you left off the graphic, 14 field goal attempts per game. That's the lowest since he left Oklahoma City after his third year in the league. So why isn't he being as aggressive? When I heard him two weeks ago say, I'm trying to figure it out. Do I need to score more? Do I need to run the team, That's be the right. player? What? I'm sitting on my couch and I can figure it out. Without Kyrie Irving's 26 points a game, you got to be aggressive. You got to go give me 25, 26 points a night. This little playmaking role isn't working. So you got to be better, James Harden. This is on him. All right? This is Kevin Durant is doing his thing, Wilds. This is on Harden, okay. and I don't like what I see one bit. I'm incredibly disappointed. All right, so I'm going to give you two options, hamstring or head. So first I'm going to give you the graphic on hamstring, pre and post hamstring injury, because I think this was never at least 100% healed. Maybe it is now, but he said it affected his conditioning, and it obviously affects his points, and it affects his explosiveness affects his separation but then it's the head part broussard and nick said he was playing lazy basketball but then that was without durant but when he's on the floor for, with durant i'm just not sure he knows what exactly his job is you say to be aggressive well it's durant's team he's never played like that even when he had superstars on his team it was still his team russ comes there my team chris paul still my team do you think it's more of a head thing or a, ha a hamstring thing for him? Well, I think it may be a mixture of both in that he's been an Iron Man throughout his career. So the hamstring was really like the first serious injury of his career. And maybe he didn't know how to respond to it, Nick. You know, maybe it has messed with his mind because Wilds yep. is right. Before the hamstring, he was great. He was great against Boston in the first round of the playoffs last year, re-aggravates the injury, and has never been the same. And while you make, that's a great point. Even with Kyrie last year, with Chris Paul before that, he was still the best player. Even if he wasn't the leading scorer, he was still the best player. Now he's not for the first time since Oklahoma City. And yeah, is he having trouble adapting with that? But Whatever it is, Nick, He's got to get it right because this is a horrible bust of a season right now. They're 0-6 against elite teams that but, they've played this year. But it's also the rule changes. And I know he's starting to get the free throw line again, but guys are yeah. guarding him more honestly, and he is struggling with it. But 20 points, 8 rebounds, 9 assists. Those are the exact numbers Harden has. They're also the exact numbers Russell Westbrook has. And Russell Westbrook, by the way, is doing it on fewer turnovers and 45% shooting, not 40%. And the question with the Lakers is, is that enough from Russ as the third best guy for them to compete for a title? The Nets need Harden to be the second best guy in can beat for a title. It's bad news for them, Jim. They need to go get Kyrie vaccinated. That's what they need. Kyrie, they need you.